especially thank the Layla Heller Gallery. This is NYU Abu Dhabi's second collaboration with Layla Heller, and it's been a pleasure to work with the gallery's wonderful team. I especially want to thank uh, Lauren Pollock for her incredible efforts in making this exhibition and artist talk happen. So thank you, Lauren. Our discussion tonight marks the opening of Warren Jinchi's exhibition, Ravaged Garden, on view until March 16th. Horn Jinchi was born in Iran. She received a degree in civil engineering from George Washington University, but then changed her career trajectory and went on to pursue studies in art at UCLA and the Art Students League of New York. Both a painter and a sculptor, Horan's work is text-based, with Persian script transforming into abstract shapes and forms. Her works are in many internationally renowned collections, including the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston, the Arthur M. Sackler Gallery, part of the Smithsonian Institution, the Farjan Collection in Dubai, and several, several major and international corporate collections. She has been featured in numerous exhibitions and solo shows, including a recent display of her newest works at the Leila Heller Gallery this past fall. Leading the conversation with Quran is Lisa Fishman, Lisa Fishman is the Ruth G. Shapiro 1937 director of the Davis Museum and Cultural Center at Wesley College. She earned her MA and PhD degrees in art history and American studies at the University of Minnesota at Minneapolis, specializing in American fine arts and visual culture. Prior to taking this current role, Dr. Fishman was associate curator of contemporary art and education at the UB Art Gallery at SUNY Buffalo followed by a role as gallery director at the Atlantic College of Art, and then as chief curator at the University of Arizona Museum of Art in Tucson. She has curated a, curated a myriad of exhibitions over the course of her career, including shows at the Davis featuring major monographic presentations of internationally acclaimed artists. Most recently, her research has shifted focus and is now looking into the Middle East. Through the support of the Eisler Fund, Dr. Fishman curated and penned a catalog for the retrospective of Iranian artist Parvlov Panaboli, excuse me, marking the artist's first U.S. museum retrospective and the first U.S. exhibition of his work in 40 years. Faraday Lashin, Only a Shadow, honored Iran's most acclaimed woman artist and it premiered in advance of her major retrospective at the Tehran Museum of Contemporary Art. Dr. Fishman's 2014 exhibition, Tony Mattelli, New Gravity, broke all previous records of attendance and media coverage at Wellesley College, so big kudos. <laughs> the timing of this artist's talk is really fortuitous, and um, I just wanted to do a small plug to NYU's art gallery, the Gray Gallery, which just opened an exhibition called Global Local 1960 to 2015, Six Artists from Iran, which really dovetails nicely with the exhibition we have here. So if you enjoy the works on view here and the discussion tonight, I really encourage you to go on to the Gray Gallery. They'll also be having many talks throughout the semester featuring um, works of Iranian artists. Uh, thank you, Carrie, for the invitation. Thank you, Lauren, for all of your help. We owe Shiva Balagi, Dr. Shiva Balagi, a thank you, too. And she's uh, in Dubai currently, but she has been a great help in bringing us together um, and helping us to prepare. So we thought that we would start uh, with an introduction to give you some background um, that provides context for the work that are, surrounds you here. In this show, obviously, you see a big body of um, paintings, but I also delve into, you will see images of uh, sculptures and uh, drawings as we go through the slides. Um, I also delve into sculptures and drawings. Um, and my work is always connected to uh, poetry, literature, text, alphabets, and there's always a connection uh, to language and uh, communication. Uh, material also plays a really important role in my, in my work. Uh, I change my material regularly, um, but tonight, you know, obviously in this uh, exhibition uh, space, you will only see my paintings. But we will go through some slides that you will see examples of uh, other forms of um, uh, art that I do. Um, 
this is one of the images of uh, a series that I did uh, based, um, uh, the series called Deracht series. And uh, Deracht basically means, uh, it's just as simple as, um, in Farsi means uh, tree. Uh, it's a repetition of the word tree in Farsi, um, which creates a composition. And this, uh, all these uh, tree paintings are done in black. And the idea of it came to me uh, very shortly after September 11th. Um, I wanted to do a series inspired by nature, by trees, um, but I wasn't sure, you know, obviously as an artist you always uh, uh, are affected by your environment, uh, events that are happening around you, um, and I just wasn't sure what I'm going to do with trees going to paint uh, trees. Um, so one day, sorry, that's my phone. I didn't turn it off. <laughs> um, so uh, on a trip to Long Island, um, as on a drive, uh, I noticed um, there was a big parcel of land uh, that was uh, caught on fire, um, and there were all these charred uh, trees and foliage. Uh, and as I was looking at all these trees, I'm like, okay, my trees are going to be black. And um, so basically this is the beginning of the idea of doing this series, um, doing um, a series of trees uh, that are all black. And so you talked about um, sort of these notions of devastation about the uh, kind of conceptual located inside the text as the text comes apart to create these forms. So there's a complicated layering that's happening, beginning with your experience and then translated through into, uh, into these works. So, okay, we'll move forward to um, the next. Uh, this series uh, are called Aleph series, and um, they're basically, you only see, um, I'm not sure how many of them, there's like, I think, uh, for, uh, like there's 16 of them here, but there are actually 96 of them, and uh, they're all um, Farsi alphabets. They're in black, red, and blue, and each set there are 32 of them. And basically, the idea of it was it was uh, English is such a, a dominant language uh, internationally that um, when we look at the language. Uh, that is foreign to us, we don't feel any connection to it. And my idea was, what if I bring some attention to the alphabets that are so unknown you know, in a Western culture? Um, and I tried to bring um, materials to this series that kind of resonates um, learning as a child. And I use Elmer's Glue ink, um, ink on this series because I kind of wanted to portray what is it like to learn from the beginning. Can you talk a little bit about the grid, about the organizing principle of the grid? Uh, yes, I also like to play with the architecture uh, up in my work because uh, architecture historically has, been, has played a big role uh, in Persian culture. And uh, I'm always fascinated how you can bring an architectural uh, element into your artwork. Mm -hmm. And um, I always try to bring uh, different elements into one body of work yeah, and just play with different aspects of it. Mm -hmm. This beautiful etching brings us to, to printmaking. Uh, yes. Um, there were the, uh, that year, which was a long time ago, um, it's summer of that year, I um, wanted to experiment with printing because printing techniques are so interesting and I wanted to figure out how I can apply printing technique to my art form. Um, so I basically spent the whole summer at the printing um, center and uh, just learned the technique and uh, basically realized because of my work, because Farsi text is written from right to left, it's not really possible to apply it in the same way. I kind of have to reverse uh, the writing um, to be able to create, um, to create the um, etching. Mm -hmm. And it was a great uh, experience, and I'm hoping one day I'll uh, have some time to get back and um, experiment in more with printing techniques. 
formally, you described that this is a, an inversion, basically, of the tree, right? Right. Yeah. Right. So you're using... My, my forms, there's a, you, you see a lot of, uh, you know, even though they're very abstract, but you will notice uh, a lot of um, natural forms mm -hmm. uh, in my art. And this work, now I'm moving to a completely different phase. You know, if you look at the uh, dates, um, and obviously keep in mind that um, as uh, you live on, you have different experiences in life and different things influence you. Um, at this time, I was uh, questioning, uh, I was thinking about the question of faith, uh, religion, spirituality, and what they all mean in our lives. Um, and then thinking about that, obviously you have to figure out, okay, what is it that you want to work on? Um, I grew up in a city that, uh, called Mashhad, uh, a very religious city, the second largest city, but um, extremely religious. There's a shrine that so many visitors go uh, visit this city. Uh, so naturally, the environment, environment was quite um, religious. And in the ritual, I was thinking about the ritual of a prayer for a Muslim and what that requires, uh, just like any religion. There's always a ritual into prayer. Um, and for a Muslim, it's a prayer rug. And for Shi'i Muslims, there's a prayer stone that as they go through um, the prayer, they place their forehead on uh, the prayer stone. Um, and looking at these, uh, remembering these prayer stones at the time that I lived in Mashhad, um, I always found them very fascinating as a young, uh, as a young person. And then later on, um, I asked my family to send me some. Uh, they're all beautiful. They all have like text of name of, uh, you know, religious names and with decorative uh, designs on them, but they're baked clay. They're basically made out of baked clay. Uh, so, um, once I got my hands on a collection of them, um, I, the way these drawings get done, I place the tablet underneath the paper, so I don't have a view of what is underneath. It's all done uh, basically by touch. Um, and I hold it down and I use uh, wax charcoal uh, to get, I do rubbings to get the relief um, from these prayer stones. And I move around the prayer stones, I change them around, and I create uh, a composition. So basically, what you see, it's really done by something that I don't really see. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's calligraphic in its own way. Um, yes, you see calligraphy that are not done by me. They're done by people that make these tablets. Mm -hmm. uh, they're very traditional, like, you know, calligraphy, um, religious names. Um, they're very beautiful, and they're you know they're about this big, so um, it's super labor intensive. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> it seems extremely labor intensive to be moving that object underneath the paper, and yes. kind of calculating and trying not to make surface. a mistake, and trying to you know you have a you know you have a composition in your head, and you're trying to achieve that composition, but as you know, while I'm doing that, I'm not so sure. Uh, you know, I'm moving something that I don't really see, and if I touch it, and I do the rubbings, you know, it might be a big mistake. Um, there are mistakes, but I think that's part of the art. And this work is also uh, a continuation of uh, the theme of religion that um, I've been working on. Um, this is basically um, uh, an exact copy of pages and pages of Quran. Um, done with ink on large uh, scrolls of paper. Uh, it's the exact copy. Uh, I have kept uh, the name of the verse, all the numbers. I have removed the words and only um, kept the uh, critical markings. Mm -hmm. um, to me, it was basically because my work is contemporary. To me, it kind of indicated uh, a minimalist um, mm -hmm. work. And uh, that part of it really appealed to me. Once I removed the words, I'm like, oh my god, these diacritical markings are so beautiful on their own. And, um, uh, and they're quite large mm -hmm. and labor, labors. And we talked about a little bit about um, Agnes Martin, about the sort of mark making and about the relationship 
uh, to kind of minimalist uh, ethos, let's say, practice mm -hmm. um, that is also involved in this, this kind of uh, meditative quality you've got going on here in this, yes, in this work. Yes, it was definitely an inspiration for mm -hmm. this work. Um, this work, this is an installation that I did as part of uh, this. There was an exhibition at MFA Boston, uh, which was called uh, uh, New Blue and White. And the idea um, for this exhibit was um, uh, basically gathering, curating um, a lot of artists that work with the concept of blue and white porcelain. Uh, blue and white porcelain has you know, has been going on for centuries. And I realized as I was asked to do this exhibit uh, that cobalt was actually found in Iran. And then uh, in Iran, they made pottery with cobalt. Uh, but cobalt went to China. And the Chinese, being one of the best potters mm -hmm. and the best in porcelain, they developed a lot of new techniques um, with porcelain. And then it traveled, the techniques traveled to Europe travel to South America, and as we all know, blue and white porcelain is a very common thing, but there is definitely an art form that goes into that. And in this exhibit, they were trying to show how this technique or how this idea still continues, how contemporary artists take that idea, and they still produce a lot of work that are based on that idea. And I was asked to do a piece for this exhibit, and uh, this is basically the prayer stones that I used for the drawings that you saw earlier, I basically recycled and made them and painted them in lacquer, white and um, blue and white lacquer, and made them into an insulation, uh, which was the concept of it was, uh, you know, again, spirituality because of the prayer stones. It's extraordinarily beautiful. I saw this at the MFA long before I met you, so uh, it was kind of an introduction to your work that way. Uh, I continue working with the uh, religious theme um, in this work, um, which was done in 2013, not too long ago. Uh, this is basically layers of uh, plexiglass. Um, they're all, all the blue lines that you see, they're, um, they're text from Quran. So basically this whole sculpture is the whole book. The whole book. 605 pages of it from the, you know, it depends, I guess, on your book. The book that I was given uh, from my mother to me uh, had 605 pages. So these are layers and layers of the whole book written on layers of plexiglass. And the outside of uh, plexiglass, of each uh, plexiglass sheet, are painted in stainless, uh, stainless paint, stain, um, glass paint because I was looking for a material that kind of uh, is transparent and you can see through. And that was the best material that I could find. And this cube-like shape is placed on a plant that has light underneath it. So basically when you view this work, which is actually at Pratt Institute um, at their library in art and architecture department, if any of you ever come across uh, um, Pratt and you um, ever visit Pr uh, Pratt, um, so the idea of uh, making a Quran was uh, there's uh, historically there's always been everyone knows that there's always these beautiful Qurans done of, throughout uh, history, and for some reason at some point contemporary artists are not that interested uh, to make uh, contemporary Qurans, and to me that was fascinating. I'm like, why did that stop? I mean. You know, bookmaking, mm -hmm. whether religious or not religious, you know, is such a beautiful uh, platform. Um, so I decided to do this work, but I wanted to have some meanings. It, it's not just um, basically rewriting Quran on plexiglass. Uh, that's why I brought in the elements of transparency and light uh, to convey my idea of what a contemporary Quran is uh, to me. So you're working with Sharpie, right? Yes. Is that correct? Yes. All the text uh, is written uh, with Sharpies. And then um, when you're looking down into the, into the cube, it's not legible. It's not uh, that you can No, read. because once you uh, place all the layers of plexiglass on top of each other, you basically you, uh, lose uh, 
um, all the text and they all melt together and they become these jagged lines mm. that you basically see lines of jagged lines. Uh, this work and uh, next um, is from my recent exhibit at Leila Haller uh, Gallery uh, that Carrie mentioned. Um, uh, I did a whole series on a book that is called The Blind Owl uh, by Sadek Hedayat, who was um, uh, a modern writer uh, from the 60s, um, a classic writer, really well known. I grew up as a teenager reading his book. Uh, not, I wasn't really allowed to read his book because the book was banned and uh, not only by the government, also uh, by my parents, so I couldn't even get my hands on one. Eventually, secretly, I got my hands on the book and read the book and there was always these rumors that this is a very dangerous book. You're not supposed to read this book because he attempted suicide early, early on in his life and actually he ended his life committing suicide again. The first time was not successful, but the second time um, he did commit suicide. So there was this rumors that if parents uh, let their children read this book, it will affect the children and they might commit suicide. So for many, many reasons, this book was totally taboo and you were not supposed to read it. I did read the book, read it a couple of times, and I'm like, okay, what's the big deal? It's, you know, it's, it's, a, you know, it's dark, yes, it's very dark. So that always resonated with me. And um, I always wanted to do a body of work that is based on my experience, how a book that is banned and what it meant to me, and also later on rereading it again. Um, Obviously, when you read a book, um, as you get older, it completely resonates to you differently as when you were younger. And I noticed a lot of pain and violence uh, in this book, uh, which was not so apparent to me as a younger person. Hmm. Um, and uh, basically, in, I mean, you only see two, uh, two works from um, this series here. Um, in this work, it's basically, all the works were either uh, a word, a dot, uh, or a page, or a quotation, or the whole book, uh, dissected, fragmented. Uh, this work is the first page of uh, the book, and each line is all the letters that are on a page. Basically, there is 18 lines in the first page, and each line indicates the first, uh, the first line, second line, third line, and they're all the letters that are in those lines. And they're all cut, uh, they're, they're made out of copper, they're all hand cut uh, in calligraphic shapes, and they're, you know, I, uh, um, I form them by hands, and they're all attached together with copper safety pins. So you were telling me that the, um, then the language becomes sharp, becomes cutting. Right, right. right. Because, um, Persian calligraphy, uh, if you notice, it has a lot of curves and uh, shapes to them, and uh, as you make the shapes, they also end, being, end up being very sharp at certain points. As you finish them off, they become very sharp. Mm -hmm. And when you uh, put them in a, a sculptural form, um, and you cut them out of, a, out of metal, they basically be, can become really, really sharp. Uh, so when you approach this work, you basically, if you try to touch it, it can hurt mm. uh, because of those sharp points. Well, um, maybe this is a good place to talk a little bit about the influence of literature and the per Persian traditions, uh, literary traditions that you pick up in your work. Well, literature, poetry is you know, a big part of um, Iranian culture. Mm -hmm. um, it comes very natural for an Iranian, when you say something in response, they tell you a quotation of a poem, so that would be their answer to whatever question that uh, you ask them. So it is a big part of uh, Persian culture, and um, it influences everything. It influences uh, art, architecture, so many different aspects of people's lives uh, in Iran. So we'll move to the studio and talk a bit about your studio practice. Um, my studio practice is uh, because I always work on series. 
uh, I always have, whenever I'm finished, I always have to clear everything off, kind of, you know, like put them away because I don't want to be looking at something that I finished. Uh, it just clears my head <clears throat> when I don't have too many things from previous things hanging around. Um, and I, just like any, anyone else, I try to do, I have this ritual uh, that I stick by it. I get up every day, just like anyone that goes to work. Uh, you have your coffee, you take shower, you get ready. Uh, and I go to my studio, whether I'm inspired or not, I always go to my studio and spend certain number of hours in my studio. Because I think that discipline um, forces me to think, forces me to um, just um, experiment. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not always, you know, making amazing work, you know, in the studio. But by the discipline of being there, uh, eventually you get to a point where you like, oh, okay, now I know what I need to do and what series I need to work on. I do a lot of drawings, a lot of sketches of different ideas. I do a lot of research. I experiment with material until I get it to a point where I'm like, okay, now I'm ready to delve into the new series. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, talk a little bit about your inks and about the um, that you're I, blending. I use a lot of inks uh, in a lot of different series that I've done. Um, and I uh, treat ink as uh, any paint. Uh, I mix them, I make my own colors, um, and I just treat it like paint. I noticed you have, I mean, you have a lot of notebooks, and it's very clear from looking through them that you're, you're working through um, ideas that, we, we were talking about this yesterday, that um, sometimes they just don't work, sometimes right. they don't work. Um, and the sort of evolution of these projects is really um, spectacular and interesting to see. Um, so we know that when we're looking at paintings like these, these are coming from a very long process of development, it seems to me. Right, right. It always starts from an idea, um, and uh, it ends up with, uh, you know, I just keep drawing and drawing, experimenting with material, making it. Uh, uh, making testers, like I mm -hmm. test things out uh, before I really start the actual work. So this brings us to the work that surrounds us, the Ravaged Garden. Uh, this group of paintings um, there's really three, when I was working on this series, there was, there's really three components that goes into making these paintings. Um, the first one that I think is kind of important, it really started from there, that I came up with the idea of doing these paintings. It was the poet. Um, uh, there's a poet called Farooq Farooqzad, which is very iconic uh, feminist poet in um, Persian culture. Uh, she, uh, I believe she was born 1932, and in, by 1960, she became a very controversial because she was a feminist uh, poet. Um, she was born into a family with a, uh, her father was a military officer, and she was three out of seven children. And I think all these aspects, they all like appealed to me, and I could identify with a lot of uh, aspects of her life and her poetry. And she got married at age uh, 16, and she moved from uh, Tehran, where she was born, to Ahbaz, which is a city in the uh, south of uh, Iran, with her husband. After a year, she got pregnant. Um, and by year two, when she had her uh, baby, they divorced, and she lost custody uh, of her child. So that was obviously extremely devastating to her. She came back to Tehran, and she started, continued her writing, her poetry, and again, she was perceived very negatively because of uh, her poetry. And at some point, she was also a filmmaker. A uh, she made a documentary. She went to uh, this area uh, where uh, there were these uh, Iranians with leprosy. Mm. Um, and she made a documentary based on their lives and uh, how, their, um, how they live and all that, uh, which actually her movie, um, uh, won a lot of awards, international awards. Um, and by going through that experience, 
she ended up adopting uh, a baby from this leper couple. Mm -hmm. uh, she brought the baby to uh, Tehran and uh, moved to uh, her mother's house. And unfortunately, she died in a car accident. So I think the poet, you know, the poet's life, her poetry, you know, they obviously, that was the beginning of the influence of uh, these paintings. And uh, then secondly, if it's calligraphy, it's like, how do I, you know, how do I make this art? Uh, my work is calligraphy based. Um, they fascinated by her poetry, her life that she lived, and uh, uh, symbolically what she means to the culture and to the society. But I didn't really want to just write her poetry on a canvas. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, because I, uh, I grew up no, uh, learning uh, how to do uh, traditional calligraphy. I was trained as a calligrapher. Um, I, but I never really wanted to be uh, I didn't really want to be the best calligrapher that there is. I always wanted to do calligraphy uh, in a way that is very unique to me and it's my, my style of uh, calligraphy. Um, so saying all that, okay, how do I take her poetry? How do I make it? How, how, how can her poetry resonate through my paintings? Mm -hmm. um, so basically by fragmenting it, uh, by dissecting it, separating um, separating par uh, parts of calligraphy elements out of the text, out of each poem, and creating a composition um, where it basically creates a tension uh, between um, traditional calligraphy and abstraction creates a feeling, a mood. Mm -hmm. And that's what I basically tried to achieve uh, on the calligraphy part. And also while I was doing all that, because she uses garden uh, as a metaphor of life in a lot of her poetry, uh, because again, garden is a very big part of uh, Iranian culture. Uh, not just Iranian, gardens are rather universal. And um, mm -hmm. you know, we have the Romans, Mm -hmm. Ottoman garden, Japanese garden. Garden is very symbolic uh, to a lot of cultures. And uh, in historically, gardens are um, rulers, and, um, rulers and kings. They always use these royal gardens to basically show their power mm -hmm. um, and uh, melted with the landscape of the cities that they, uh, they were building. And in a private life, also garden means a place where people go gather with their family, with their friends, to basically develop intimacy, to develop a, a closeness with their family and friends. So because she does use a lot of metaphors as garden, I also, as I was doing this, thinking about a garden and what happens to a garden when garden gets neglected, whether it's, um, a, gar a royal garden, whether it's a private little backyard garden, what does it happen? What does it happen when something disastrous goes on? Whether it's wars, environment, um, displacement. Um, so keeping all those elements in mind, that's where I came to do these uh, paintings. Can you speak a bit about the relationship between the text and the image, say in this in this book? Uh, this is a part of uh, one of her poems, um, and I do many layers of writing on top of each other to create the composition, and uh, sometimes to create a feeling, I take a word or a letter or a portion of a letter, uh, it kind of scapes, uh, scapes the composition. Uh, and it's done very spontaneously. It is not done with too much planning, mm -hmm. even though I sound like one of those artists that I do a lot of planning, but I also like a little bit of uh, a spontaneous action into the, uh, into the paintings. And you see this throughout most of these paintings. There are some paintings here that we don't have on display here, but um, I think it's pretty consistent, uh, the clustering and releasing. So can you talk a little bit about your palette and your decisions that you're making about color? Uh, okay, palette is also another thing that I'm a little bit uh, too controlling about. Mm -hmm. uh, 
um, I, it's kind of predetermined. Like every series that I do, I kind of have a palette in my head mm -hmm. uh, that what that palette is going to be. Uh, whether it's a range of uh, blues and greens, and at times I bring a little bit of um, you know, uh, a contradictory colors into it just um, to humor the painting. Mm -hmm. um, but usually it's pretty much predetermined what my palette is. So this form, this kind of swelling, What's happening here? Um, imagine a garden with. Um, See these on the back uh, It's a ravaged garden. Yeah. It's a ravaged garden. Do you think this is a, a dystopian view? Um, a view of chaos and sort of neglect and um, dissolution? Um, yes. Mm -hmm. And th for that reason, the series, uh, the series are called Entropy. Mm -hmm. um, there's obviously, there's a certain order in, the, in these paintings, but there's also chaos. Mm -hmm. Well, we talked about um, the fragility of the world, of taking on this topic and taking on this um, incredibly important uh, piece of poetic um, history and transforming it um, into um, into paintings that are both uh, beautiful and carry a kind of weight that maybe isn't um, immediately apparent. You know, you're beguiled by beauty, and then there is uh, something much darker happening at work. Um, that seems like a great place to invite questions. Um, yes. I saw the fabulous Iranian artist Shot Ray Gallery, and I was just struck by how much calligraphy is such an integral part of it, as opposed to Western art, where it's a purely visual experience. And I was wondering whether um, is it historical and cultural, or does aesthetics come into play? Because your alphabet is just so fantastic, so much prettier than our Western <laughs> alphabet. <laughs> Uh, yes, it's definitely history. There, there, there's an art form of calligraphy um, in certain parts in some cultures that it doesn't really exist in the West. For example, we have Japanese calligraphy, we have Chinese calligraphy, Persian calligraphy, Arabic calligraphy, North Africans. Certain cultures, they, you know, they have this tradition of uh, using, also. yes, mm -hmm. uh, using Sanskrit as well. Uh, using calligraphy as an art form, uh, which has not really been the case in the Western world. Um, so that's, you know, it's kind of unique to those cultures. Uh, so it's integrated, all three elements, historical, cultural, and exactly. So. Exactly, exactly. What's your favorite uh, character? Uh, sorry, favorite? Your favorite uh, Uh, in Latin? No, in, in, in your language. The favorite word? The Aleph. Or uh, Aleph is definitely uh, my favorite, yes. I've done a whole series on Aleph. <laughs> because Aleph is the first letter um, of the alphabet. Uh, it's also uh, the first letter in Hebrew, in Farsi, and in Arabic. And there's something about that that appeals to me. but uh, traditionally uh, Arabic is written with a quill and I was wondering uh, if you're using a quill or a brush and um, I actually yeah. on that differences. Uh, I actually use uh, these metal uh, pens uh, that are they come in all different sizes um, anywhere from tiny little metal pen to a pen that is about two inches um, and it has all these cuts that holds the ink, the tip of the pen has all these cuts that holds the, um, holds the ink. So it's like a quill. Right, it's, right. It's but the tip is quill, in metal, the tip, metal. Metal. right. But there's no brush. No brush, no. And the second thing is how do you get the ink to stay on the canvas? Um, very good question. Uh, <laughs> uh, I work on them on the floor, on the table, because if I stand them up, the ink will, uh, will drip. 
Uh, so every layer of uh, calligraphy that I do, every layer of writing, uh, it's usually done on the floor or flat on the table. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your wonderful talk and the wonderful work you've talked about. Thank you. I'm very curious about the different resonances that your work has for people who can read Farsi or at least make out the letters. Uh, and those of us who can't, and whether in the reception of your work you have some knowledge of this, whether it has come to you, or whether you even hope that someone who can read these reformed words, you see these reformed and reworked words and, and the beautiful abstract forms grown out of them, whether you, the intention is for someone who could read them to pick up sort of poetic uh, floors, say, or little fragments, or whether that's really not what you're after, whether you really see these as the, the letters as something that allows you to do various kinds of abstract experimentation. Um, it's really the latter. Uh, I really see uh, all these shapes and forms and the calligraphy as brush strokes. Mm -hmm. I don't really see them as uh, a text. Uh, once they're done, the text was really the inspiration where it got me started. Um, and when I'm done, it's not really, I have moved away from the text. And they really, every uh, word and every, uh, every letter that is there, they're really just uh, a brush stroke. If you view them as just a brush stroke, then they don't look so far into you anymore. So you start off with a historical cultural thing, and then you end up with a pure aesthetic. Yes. Yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much for the talk. Thank you. Um, in many of your work, it really reminds me of the two one of the two paintings that uh, you have behind you. There is a sense of spirituality and Sufism traditions, like a mirroring or um, having a zik or like, uh, I wonder if there is any uh, role in your type of the practice of your painting that you have made on this side. Sufism or like the kind of the spirituality of the writing and the written that create these um, you know, words together as a composition? I think the repetition of anything uh, puts you in a mood and, it, uh, and a sense of spirituality. Um, and repetition is very common in my work, and it's also very common in um, any Middle Eastern um, art form. And I think the repetition of anything can make someone feel spiritual. It's quite meditative, but mm -hmm. also intensive. Right. right. Very focused. Hello. Mm -hmm. Hi. Um, about how many layers of calligraphy, on average, does a painting require, or <coughs> Um, each painting is really different. I mean, they're all many, many layers, and some are, for example, these two paintings have definitely have a little bit more layers, and the layers are all throughout the canvases. And the other uh, canvases, uh, there are parts that are more layered, and there are parts that are less layered. And that, to answer your other question, I do have to wait for a layer to get dry before I apply the next um, layer. Mm -hmm. Hi, I have um, well, one first question. Uh, you mentioned that you have it's actually the inverse of the question that was given before, because she was asking about fragmentation and the idea of the, the poetic fragment. Um, I'm actually more interested in the, the non-Western calligraphic tradition and your relationship to rebus in that way, or how calligraphic traditions lend themselves to rebus, especially if you're dealing with verse or, or repeated verses. Um, and also, in the same question, I'm wondering, with these paintings, perhaps, or with the other bodies of work, who do you see as your audience? When I'm doing these paintings, I'm not thinking about my audience. Uh, I, I just do them. It's just. Uh, because I think if I think about my audience, 
um, it actually would make me hesitate to make art. You know, we were, we were talking about that too, about this notion of um, intelligibility, of reading, and of instead of reading, uh, sort of putting poetry into painting, right? Writing poetry into painting in this in this way that um, both claims a tradition and intervenes in it, which I think is interesting. Mm -hmm. And doing that, I, I would suppose, um, involves something you described as um, uh, you know a process that is not in, that you're not entirely in control of. The outcome is not assured as you embark. Right. Um, and I would imagine that that's, you know, in this moment in history, it's as true about your audience. Um, you just don't know. You don't really know. No. I, I have no idea who would view the works and how it's perceived and, um, you know, to think about all those elements. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for me, it's basically useless because I think uh, one should not allow that to affect what you do. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? I, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Just out of curiosity, have you ever done a grid with the entire collection in 96 or just the 16? Uh, sorry? So I, have you ever done a grid, you know how you had the 16 paintings of the collection in 96? Mm -hmm. Have you ever done the entire 96? Yes, I have. There, uh, 96 of them are done, yeah. But they're just not, we just don't have an, I didn't have an image of uh, all of them together. Could you tell us uh, what's next? Um, yes, I'm um, working on a piece <coughs> that is going to be exhibited at the Freeze uh, Art Fair in May in New York. And I'm also embarking on a whole new series um, that I will be exhibiting next year, uh, May 2017 in Dubai. Great. So um, I'm busy. Yes, seems like. <laughs> So, I mean, of course, artists are planning way ahead and but. working on series way ahead, and particularly when you're putting things on a boat to go to Dubai, you're <laughs> way, way ahead. Yes, as uh, <laughs> we were talking about this yesterday, people think artists, they don't have deadlines. Right. Uh, <laughs> but we have deadlines. <laughs> yes, exactly. Anyone else? Thank you all so much for Thank being you. here. Thank you for your time.